I'd like to welcome you to our forum, which is a message of hope. Public schools looking forward. We like this. It's a little easier to talk on this subject than it was 15, 14 months ago on the financial subject of school. And we are looking forward to an education tonight. We are indeed blessed with many distinguished presenters tonight. In our audience, we have representatives from the 16 school districts in the county, from IU 13, from private schools, from both parochial schools. Representatives vary from superintendents to school board members to directors of finance and directors of education. We also have numerous individuals from beyond Lancaster County. Why have we chosen technology as an avenue of hope? Today, every profession, with the exception of education, is using technology extensively in their endeavors. Education has been slow to accept innovative approaches, technology, and teaching. A dilemma that's about our students are deeply immersed and increasingly immersed in technology in their homes. They will be asking increasingly what are we doing technologically in our schools to match what we're experiencing at home. Another reason for our test's decision for this topic is we look at two of the most forward-looking, successful individuals of modern times. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Both of them have aggressively stated that technological innovation in education is the future of education. Tonight, we look at the future technology and education from a national, a state, and a local level. All of us are looking forward to learning a lot tonight, and I hope you will enjoy these presentations.
we done, Jim? <laughs> I'd like to stop and start. This is a Presbyterian church. Nobody sits from here. We've got four empty rows. <laughs> Monty, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors who are listed in the back of the program. Our largest group in 15 years. And I think it says something about the subject uh, this evening. Uh, this is a subject which our last terms a legacy issue. That is an issue to which the quality of informed decision making is critical and of lasting consequence. Last year we needed a forum wake up call, as Lonnie said, uh, to the economic crisis facing education today. This evening we'll be encouraged about the options and the sound thinking and real initiatives underway for the 21st century learner all happening in the midst of the economic new normal, a message of hope. We have a full evening, thought-provoking video clips that will work, and six absolutely all-star presenters here, and we sincerely hope that you will stay in the duration. There is no boost on this train. They're all engines. You will be very pleased and surprised at what three of our local superintendents and their districts are doing. We will have a break at midway with freshly reloaded food, at which time we will also collect any back of the program panelist questions from the audience. Also, please be sensitive to the extraordinary acoustics in this hall, which means that we can hear you on the stage whispering in the back two rows. We have had a change of venue briefly tonight. We are moving some speakers around. Our, uh, our first speaker, you know, Karen Cater, uh, was called into a meeting by, uh, by Arnie Duncan uh, at 1 o'clock today, and she's somewhere between Wrightsville and here, so we will move her into the middle. Um, you may have noticed also on your invitation that a Pennsylvania perspective would be provided by Dr. Amy Morton, Executive, De Executive Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Amy had to withdraw for health reasons, and we wish her well. It's been suggested, however, that the attitude of the state government of Pennsylvania is public schools, you're on your own. Harsh, perhaps, but not without a ring of truth. Fortunately, we, we have an individual who's making this work, a state leader in best practices and responsible school technology research and deployment, with a special emphasis on school-to-school -school and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And he's one of our own. You have his vibrant program enough to say that he's received more school technology leadership awards in the past several years than anyone in the state. One thing he emphasizes is that change must be an expected constant in public schools. And the need for a balanced but forward-looking responsiveness is ever-present. Complacency has no place in public education today, and certainly not in Charlie Reisinger's life. Hold on for Charlie Reisinger. Get my wires sorted out here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm going to take you through a lateral history of technology. I'm going to talk to you about several stories of how innovative and sometimes disruptive technology has fundamentally and profoundly impacted our culture and our schools. You see, as technology has changed, some organizations have thrived, some have died, and others have transformed. And I think that we can learn several lessons from innovators, technology innovators, and from their inflection. So notice that when the external is positive, our hyperbole is to the right and the left. Sam Hall is the CEO of John Hall's on demand educational resource Khan Academy. He started making educational videos and compatible practice software in 2004 for his cousins that offer lessons in many levels of mathematics and science and they can be viral Let's say you have a question and you're going to have a question on limits. There's a thing on limits, 
And you can go back and you can put that to on limits and just say act to that. like, you know what, I don't understand limits. Can you explain a little bit more on that? But there's still stuff. You don't even know how to navigate or know what you shouldn't be looking at to answer your question. But we have a pretty viable community. We have a million users the model. So the Bruce's second point about hands-on learning is, is, is a completely fair point. And what I think what kind of having enables is more time in the classroom for actual hands-on learning. The students are getting the lecture at home at their own pace. They can remediate if they need to. And not that they go to the classroom and do project-based learning and spend more time with them. So to Kirkhoff's point about the team relationship uh, or connection with the teacher, it's a really a deep understanding. Uh, I think it's true. I think it would be a, a very optimistic if we think a lot of the students are getting that deep intimate connection in the classroom right now. And to some degree, even though it is virtual, it is strange, but I get a lot of feedback from a lot of people that they feel a deep intimate connection with me, that I feel like they're a neighbor or they're older brother, and that uh, I'm sitting next to them and talking about that they're a kitchen table or that they even I love Christopher Berger, someone's point of ten, you know, I'm glad I was in the world of life. Uh, to the point about the place in universities, I, I, I think it's going to happen anytime soon, uh, but I think it's an interesting idea, and I think the thing about that is to realize that the universe is two things, it's a credential and it's learning. I think Khan Academy is going to be able to really uh, change how the learning part is done in a pretty significant way. Uh, the credentialing part, you know, your degree from Stanford or Harvard, uh, that will probably be there for, for a little while. I think if you fast forward uh, 10 years from now, I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, this is still going to change happening. Uh, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, I think an employer would rather see your law from a site like Khan Academy, where it doesn't just get a 3.2 GPA in um, psychology. It gets what you did, when you did it, how well you did it, how well you were able to help your peers, how, how consistently did you work while I was back for three hours every day for 20 years on this stuff. This is not just the persistent kind of guy that I want to work with. And we'll be able to get people that have been really accepted that can be a more powerful uh, transcript than, than, than just a, a high level degree right now. <laughs> so, Kirk, I'm going to go ahead and just jump in here. Um, I'm going to ask
Uh, Karen, thanks for stopping. We're honored to have you. And a warm thanks to welcome, please, for the Director of the Office of Educational Technology of the United States Department of Education, Karen Cady. Personalized learning is, 
You can access things kind of when you're ready for it. But it's also about bringing in kind of a long tail of interest in the kinds of things that really speak to you as a learner, whether it be music or photography or robotics or Lego or science or you know, astronomy, mathematics, whatever it is, whatever speaks to you as a learner, leveraging that and, and making use of those kinds of things. So the learning chapter, if we kind of don't read or buy into any of the rest of this, the learning chapter is the most important. The teaching chapter is the partner chapter that says, okay, if we think this is how people learn in the 21st century and the kinds of opportunities we have for our students, teachers, what do teachers do? And how do we support teachers? So the notion in the National Education Plan is that teachers may be highly connected. So this notion of a highly connected teacher, connected to the content, to the tools, to the resources, to the data, and connected to the experts and expertise to help them when and where they need it. So it's interesting, you know, last night I was buying an airplane ticket for my daughter, and uh, you know, the United Airlines site, and the little thing pops up and says, would you like to chat with someone? Basically, are you having a problem, do you need help right now as you're trying to buy this airplane ticket? And, you know, I didn't. But I thought, you know, that's so interesting. What if teachers had every moment someone that they could go, yeah, I need, I need help right now. This kid, I can't figure out how to help him understand this particular concept, or you know, this behavior problem is happening, or this learning disability, or this scenario, or these two kids, or whatever the thing is. Could we create a system that teachers are highly connected to what they need, when and where they need it? It's not crazy, right? A lot of the stuff that I talk about is stuff that's already happening, but just in scenarios that are a lot in the consumer industry or in the music industry or the entertainment industry. And how do we leverage those kinds of technologies, those kinds of interactions to support teaching and learning? So, teaching and learning. The third chapter that kind of rounds out the, uh, the vision is the assessment chapter. And we really focus on assessment for the purposes of helping people know what to do next. So it's the notion of leveraging assessment to create feedback loops as close to the learning moment as possible, right? So it's, it's really interesting. A lot of, in a lot of places, assessment has come to mean the one data point, the one, the one thing we do once a year, and that's the big assessment with a big capital A. We're talking about assessment, assessing where you are each and every moment so that you can do better, you know what to do next, recommendation engines, the kinds of things that, that we can do when we, can, when we leverage high quality assessments and technology powered assessments that can adapt to where the learner is. So there you go, that's the best, fastest version of the National Ed Tech Plan, uh, the, the, the crux of it. If you buy into that high level vision, that's kind of high end vision, then we talk have a chapter on what is the infrastructure that needs to be in place in order to make this happen. It's fairly straightforward. We need broadband built up across this country. And the FCC is working on this, the Department of Commerce, right? It's kind of the highways, we used to build highways with the trucks and commerce. We need information highways, we need broadband to improve the opportunity for the United States to fully participate in a, a globally networked commerce space. Um, so, so that's part of the infrastructure. And then it's also devices in the hands of students and teachers so that they can, in fact, be interacting on a personal level with the, the materials and the resources. And then the last chapter is about productivity. And so, you know, productivity, uh, Secretary Duncan actually did a whole speech on productivity and, and talked about, you know, it's not like eating broccoli. It actually isn't that bad. What we really need to think about is not productivity as in children are little factory widgets and we got to get them through the process, but rather think about productivity as the most efficient and effective way of interacting with, with people. So if you are all fourth graders, and this was, you know, September 27th, you may all be doing, say, two-digit multiplication because you're all in my classroom, you're all the same age, and that's what we're doing today. Some schools go as far as they have pacing guides. They say, this is the day, this is what you're doing, when you're done with that day, you move on, here's your day, move on, move on, move on. That's not an efficient model, right? It's not efficient because even though you're all fourth graders, you are actually probably anywhere between, you know, maybe a first grade level and a ninth grade level or, or something like that. There's a wide span of abilities and, and competencies and interests and um, 
there's a huge opportunity to be much more effective and, as some people say, precise about the interventions and the things we do with students. So that's partly what we're talking about with productivity. We say, you know, there, there isn't going to be a whole bunch of more money, but what we do need to do is get much more efficient. We need to get way more students over a much higher bar. So how do we think about that with this kind of notion of effective and efficient and productive um, environments? Most of the other industries have leveraged technology to improve productivity. So we're kind of saying, now is the time in education. So from the very first days of office, President Obama and Secretary Duncan said, by 2020, we need, to, we need to regain our lead, right? We need to get more students to have some, to be to graduate high school, college, and career ready, so that they can, we can regain that space of having the highest per capita college graduate uh, number in the world. We're now around 40%, this would require us in today's numbers to get to around 60%. So in essence, again, getting many more students over a higher bar. That's kind of how, what we need to do. So we do need to build in efficiencies. Okay, so the cool part is, I really do think, we do think, a lot of people are starting to say, this is education's internet moment, right? So what that means is when the internet hit, it was a rapid, rapid improvement, rapid evolution of resources, websites, products, interactions, all of those kinds of things that, when you think about it, from 19, what, 94, 95, 96, 97, that was the early days of the internet, right? This is quite a while later, and in education we have not realized, we haven't realized the, the benefits and, and haven't actually been able to leverage all of those resources as well as possible. So why do we think now is the time, right? So it's been you know, 20 years, 15 years, why do we think now is the time? So there's four things kind of in the technology space that we can today stand on. Why today, why this is kind of education's internet moment. And the first is mobility. So how many of you have the whole internet in your pocket or in your purse at this time? I should have, does anyone not? Pretty much everybody, right? So the whole internet, so when you think about that, that's crazy, right? And that has only been a couple of years. The full internet and all the vast resources of the internet, from primary source documents to fully produced videos, all sorts of kinds of interactions. So mobile access is the first. The second is social interactions for learning. The opportunities that you have to learn online with people. Again, I think about the you know, United Airlines, you know, do you need some help kind of thing. But also the interactions in you know, social games, the latest one I was just reading is uh, what's it called? Let's draw something or draw something or what's it called? Somebody. Who's playing it? It's like Pictionary with your friends. It's like we're doing friends but with pictures. Anyway, you, put, you draw something, you send it out, and then people guess what it is. Anyone know what it is? Let's draw. Let's draw. Thank you. Whoever said that? Thank you. If I had a prize, throw it out. To it. Let's draw. Right. So, so those kinds of things, these social interactions, and that's fairly frivolous. Right? But it's also just an example of the kinds of things that you can do. So digital content. Highly produced, unbelievable amount of digital content from lectures, from explanations, from highly produced video from you know, the Antarctica under the ocean. Lots of, of digital content that is, is there for people to learn about what they want to learn about when they need to learn it. So if you wake up in the morning and you need to learn something new, you can have this conversation around your dinner table or whatever. When you wake up in the morning and you need to learn something new, what do you do? What do you do? You might think of what the topic is, you might ask, think about questions and search terms, do some searches, you might phone some friends, call people up, you might reach out to them, you might query um, in, a, in a, a chat room or something like that. Right? So when people need to learn something new, social interactions, and then they leverage all of this amazing digital content. And the fourth thing is data. So data is interesting because it's, it's a space that we're looking at carefully in terms of the, the kinds of information that people use to give you back uh, uh, recommendations for, for purchases or different kinds of things like that. And I'm sure you all want to see the on the side of your browser, your, the ads, depends on you know, what you've been searching for lately. And some of it's you know, borderline creepy, right? So we have to make sure that we pay really close attention to this 
and we are raising a generation of students who understand these things, right? And that we as adults understand the kinds of things that are possible when we can leverage data. Because in education, we have an opportunity to leverage data to understand much more about how people learn, about what pathways will be most helpful, about the kinds of uh, uh, social networks and the dynamics in, in a school or in an environment. There are lots of things we can do and understand with the use of data. There also are some really interesting things with respect to big data sets that can be brought into the classroom, things from astronomy or earthquake data or you know, uh, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of things. Some of the, the data around um, you know, the human genome and just there are lots and lots of things that are really incredibly interesting that we can bring into the classroom and much of it has to do with this notion of big data. So when you think about what's happening just outside of education in the consumer space, in the, in the science space, in the, um, in the advanced you know, mathematics and financial space, I mean, all of these fields are fully powered up because of these kinds of things. Mobility, social interactions for learning, <coughs> big data, and lots of digital content. So in education, when we say it's education's internet moment, we're seeing this transition from a predominantly print-based classroom to a digital learning environment. And it doesn't mean we're ditching books, but before the printing press, you could learn from people, lectures, interactions. Printing press, now you can still learn from people, you can also learn from books. And now, you can still learn from people, you can still learn from books, and you can also learn from this really interesting new digital learning environment. So this, this transition from print to digital. So Secretary Duncan and various other people have been saying the next five years, we really need to figure out how to manage a successful and clean and clean, uh, clear transition so that all learners of whatever age can benefit from the best digital learning environments in addition to books and people. Does that make sense? So in, in questions, you can sort of take that apart if it makes sense if it uh, makes sense to you or if you have other, other questions. So it was actually a year and a half ago, that, um, or a year ago, January, uh, that President Obama said in one line of this long State of the Union speech, a lot of it was innovation, about students learning, learning with digital textbooks. And then Secretary Duncan and, and Chairman Janikowski of the FCC need to transition to digital learning within the next five years. So just to take this apart a little bit more, um, when we say this, it makes some, some people uncomfortable because, you know, we have this kind of pre-floating anxiety about it, right? We're not quite sure what this means and what this looks like, and I'm not sure if I want my kids on computers, you know, or whatever. A lot of time pre-floating anxiety, so we have to sort of name, like, what are the, why would we even do this? What is it about technology that is different than print, right? So that's an important distinction because we aren't just creating a book but making it in a digital format because it might be lighter, might not get dog ear might be able to update it, but that's actually not probably worth the kind of, uh, kind of effort. But let's think about the other things that can be embedded and what else we can do. So these three words are, are they sound simple, but we can build equity. We can create opportunities for students in places where they may not have access to either the courses or the teachers or the content that, they, that other places have. So if you think about equity from zip code to zip code, we want to create the best possible opportunity to learn regardless of where people live. So this notion of trying to build equity by creating access to improve the opportunity to learn everywhere. So that's the, the kind of the bottom line. So let's think of some examples of what we can do. So first, the video right before this was the Khan Academy video, right? So when I talk to reporters and other people about Khan Academy, it is very interesting. There are something like close to 3,000 videos. They're all organized and tagged now. Um, but what is interesting about that is that these videos are repeating explanations, right? You can listen to him explain something, and you can listen to it again, and again, and again, and again. So what schools are now doing is they're saying, huh, if students can listen to this outside of school, 
right? So they go home at night, they can listen to the video, do, try some problems. When they come to school, it's the opportunity to talk to each other, to work closely with each other, to work with the teacher. So I've been in you know, the trial of the uh, pilot classroom for Khan Academy in Los, Angeles, Los Angeles, California. And it is interesting, right? So the kids all have their devices with their map, and they can show you where they are, and where they're going, and what's red and green, red and green and white, white meaning they haven't touched it yet, haven't tried it. Red meaning they've tried it and they are not passed it. Green meaning they've, they've tried it and they haven't passed it. So students kind of have their own, their own map, and the teachers were engaging students in some kind of group kind of uh, projects. So it's, it's interesting. But it is, uh, the Khan Academy videos, it's not the full, like, host of teaching, right? Teachers have special relationships with students. They know how to motivate them. And as we, as we take some of these things off their plate, like the repeated explanations, teachers can spend more time listening to students, interacting, small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera. So this whole notion is something that is kind of catching on in a variety of places. There are lots of other kind of infographics, other places that you can get uh, explanations. So as we're talking about the assessment chapter, this notion that feedback can be as close to the learning moment as possible. So the other saying with the Khan Academy example, right? They also now have problem sets. So students can try problems, and if they need to watch the video, they can watch it again, but also they can get scaffolded helps, right? They also can try the problem, if they get wrong, and it can help them, tell them what they might have done wrong, and that kind of thing. Those kinds of environments are getting better and better, smarter and smarter. So this notion of feedback as close to the learning moment as possible. So another thing that we've been talking about is this, is this notion of a learning positioning system. So, you know, so I, the first one to say I couldn't have gotten here without my GPS because, you know, when, like I said, I wandered around Washington and grew up and I up now. But this notion of a learning positioning system takes the same idea, except instead of having a map of, you know, Maryland and Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C., you have a map of mathematics, right? So the map of mathematics, and then you start with numeration and go through all the different parts of mathematics, all the way to calculus and you know, trigonometry, geometry, statistics, probability, you could map out mathematics if you had kind of a big, big space. So now you think about that as a map, and each one of the elements can have a latitude-longitude marker. So now once you have this map, right, and it can be visual, and it can be things that students can move along, people have talked about different, different um, uh, sort of metaphors for this map, but you can, you can move along this map, and the learning positioning system can help you, help you as a learner figure out what path to take, you know, take a safe turn, go back over there and try this stuff again, because if you're not getting this, that means you didn't understand that. So you can kind of get a sense of this notion of learning positioning system. That's the kind of thing that's possible to put in the hands of students every day at this point. So Khan Academy has sort of wobbled down that path. They have sort of a very rudimentary learning positioning system. This is the visual that they use. Again, this could be, it'll get so much better over time. But again, students kind of take these different pathways. And as we leverage the learning analytics, the information that's coming off of X, students' interaction with these systems, the system gets smarter and smarter the more it gets used. So for example, the pathways between these, we start to learn. Is this an essential pathway, or is this a dotted line pathway? Do students do better if they go this way and then that way, or do the students go better if they go this way and then that way? So there are things that we can learn the more these systems get in place and the more they get used. We can also begin to think about with these latitude-longitude markers, what are the other kinds of things that we can pin to these maps, right? You can have animations and simulations and games and models. You can have chapters, you can have books, you can have uh, virtual tours, you can have uh, you know, maps and, and lectures and uh, information, all sorts of things associated with these latitude-longitude markers. You can have an increasing set of problem sets. 
that you can test yourself on or try, or your teacher can assign to you and, and engage you with. So this whole notion of lots of digital materials that can support you and that we can get better and better at recommending, recommendation engines can get better the more we, we work these with students. So these are the kinds of things that we're really, really excited about. Another opportunity with technology that you can't do without technology is this notion of engaging experts, right? So there's this uh, website called Bugscope, and it's not a website, it's actually an electron, micro, a scanning electron microscope that's at a, a university, and what you can do is you can take bugs from your backyard or your schoolyard or wherever, put them in something, and we'll, whatever, okay, yeah, make sure they don't eat each other on the way in the mail, Send them in, and then schedule a time to look at your bugs under their microscope. The expert at the bug school, the expert will interact with the students, talk to them about their bug, their very own bugs, what they're seeing. So these are things you can't do without technology, right? You can you you can't you can't access this stuff in any other way. <coughs> Unless, of course, you can afford a scanning electron microscope in your school. They also have lots of, lots of other tutorials kind of just in time. So that's kind of the engagement like here. But then you can also see all the ways that they prepare the bugs and all the, all the different things and, and it kind of goes off in so many directions from there. So that's the bug scope. The opportunity to connect and participate globally. So this isn't globally, this is, all, this is Iowa. How many people have been watching the, the Eagles in Iowa? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> so they're so cool. They're, this, this is actually from last year because they haven't hatched this year yet. But these eagles are way up high in the tree in this five foot gigantic nest. The mother and the father are eagle. These are big birds, by the way. Lay you know, on the nest. They lay, this year they laid three eggs. Last year they laid three eggs. You, there's, a, there's a camera with an infrared so you can even see them all night long a camera trained on them so that you can watch these eagles all the time. It's crazy. They, one of them will fly down and grab a big old fish from the river, bring it back and drop it on the nest and the fish is still flopping, you know, and then they, they start grabbing pieces of it, feeding it to the, to the babies. It is really cool. That's the kind of thing if I were teaching any grade actually, because I'm not in school and I love it, but you know, we know fourth graders, first graders, second, you know, seventh graders, whatever. You can have that in your classroom. You can do journals, you can do, I mean, I'll, yeah, anyway, we can go on from there. But this is just really, really fun, and this is one of my favorite pictures. I actually snapped this on my screen as I was watching them. I did a, a screenshot and, and grabbed this. It was like the little one in the middle has little arms around the other ones. <laughs> and it was so cool. So there are these webcams in lots of different places, and you know, again, you can chat with the experts, they'll, they'll explain things, you can get lots of information um, that, that these, uh, these eagles uh, incent you to ask. All right. One more thing, accessibility. Accessibility. So when they think about accessibility, a lot of times we think about um, the kinds of things that are created for people with disabilities. So if you think about uh, sidewalk cutouts, right? The, the, if you come to a street and it has a little cutout there. That was created so people with disabilities in wheelchairs or whatever could, could, leverage, could use the sidewalk. It also, by the way, ends up being really helpful for people with strollers, people with bicycles, people with maybe mobile problems, people driving in you know, suitcases, whatever reason, they're really helpful for lots and lots of people. So accessibility with technology is much the same. So one of the technologies that we talk about when we talk about accessibility is the opportunity for text on the screen to read to you. Right? So even now, take something in your browser and ask your computer to read it to you, and it will read it to you. So that's really helpful if you have uh, visual impairments, if you are just learning a language, if you are you know, emerging reader, all sorts of reasons why this is helpful. It's created for people who are blind and have visual impairments, but it's actually helpful for lots of people. So the opportunity to use accessibility technology, whatever they may be, for people who have all sorts of disabilities, abilities, contextual, contextual abilities, right? They, they have problems in certain instances. These kinds of technologies 
can be designed into any kinds of programs that learners use. So the, the term is universal design for learning, and it's a really, really important and very cool space. The opportunity to create things so that you, regardless of what needs you have, can access the, the, the text, the content. So as my friend said, when we talk about people with print disabilities, my friend David Rose says, it's not the person with the print disability, it's the print that's disabled. The print can't turn its own pages, it can't read to you, it can't explain, it can't take you deeper, ask you questions, or take you further. So when we think about enabling print to be usable by lots of different kinds of people with different disabilities, that's what we're talking about. So accessibility is really cool. And there's, there's new work being done at, at WGBH to take things like this, that's a complex diagram, and figure out the best way of explaining it in words so that, again, if somebody can't see it, they can still benefit from kind of the imagery associated with putting things into pictures. So really, really interesting work going on in that space as well. And finally, publishing to a wide audience. This is, a, this is an old story now, but it's actually really interesting. This was a young uh, boy in uh, South Korea who was playing Paco Cannon D on his electric guitar. It was awesome. It is awesome. You can see it. It's awesome. As you see here, there have been 6 million views globally. And what was interesting about this story, if you follow this young boy, he, people started um, asking him for more music. And other young people who were trying to follow or learn from him weren't saying, can you make it easier? They were saying, that's something harder. Let's do, you know, we want to do something more. So this whole notion of the challenge and of the opportunity to learn something because there, there's somebody who can, who, can, who can teach you and who can work with you and give you examples and demonstrations. Those are the kinds of things we see when we really power up the learning environment. Extending the school day is something we talk a lot about. How can we, in fact, get more time with students? And again, the opportunity with technology to connect in school and out of school. <coughs> so at the Department of Education, we have a variety of projects going on. I'm not going to talk through these, except to say we're working on connectivity. We're working to make sure all schools can, can access the internet. We're working on something called the League of Innovative Schools that's going to that will connect schools with each other so that they can share in procurement processes, so they can share practices, so they can share in research and evaluation. Something that's a development of an evidence framework. We all want to know what works, in what context, for what students, at what age, etc. We need more evidence and more understanding. So we're working on something along those lines. We're working to make sure that as we move to digital, we don't have a giant pile of stuff. And when you do a search, you get you know, millions of hits and you only look at the person by, right? We want, we're working on something that will help people discover content much more readily. And finally, we're working on communities of practice and research around what really does help teachers in the moment every single day the notion of connected educators. So with that, it is such a good time to be a learner. We're all learners every single day. Excited to, uh, to be here. We'll have questions later. Just want to close with this. You know, what President Obama has said, education is a moral obligation. Obviously, right? We're, a lot of us are in education because it is a moral obligation. It's our it's students' only way. It's a social justice. It's students' way out of poverty. But it's also an economic imperative. We need to care not just about our own students, but about everybody's students, all of these students, so that they will, in fact, be creating a better future for communities, for, for the country, for the world. We're in a fight for the future and a fight that absolutely depends on education. And with that, I'm going to stop. I think we're going to have questions in a bit. No, we're going to be came down the aisle in the dark earlier and said, you know, I can go forever, but I love to take questions. We're going to have a panel after the break, after our next uh, our third speaker in the break, 
but you have an opportunity now for some big questions uh, that we can take. Jennifer, I presume they can serve food about uh, 10 minutes early. Uh, we'll take some big questions right now for, for Karen. You'll have you, this way in advance coming in, so take it. Okay, a couple good questions. The, the acoustics are great in here, so. Uh, Karen, you want to pick Sure. sure. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, is it true, or uh, my impression is that mentoring is very important to the success of a student, and with this high technology, it seems to be that it's being um, diminished to the detriment of the children. So that's such Comment. a great question. So the question is, you know, mentoring, how do we think about mentoring? We don't want kids, you know, we don't want to diminish social interaction. We don't want to diminish the important relationship with adults and with mentors. What we think, what we have seen, is that technology actually does not diminish social interaction. It actually sort of amplifies it in some interesting ways. Think about the people that you're connected with now that you never would have been connected with, right? So it sort of, sort of maintains some social interactions. Mentoring is unbelievably important, and we know that the most important thing in a child's in a child's education career is the, is the teacher in the classroom. And so the teacher as a mentor or outside mentors as mentors, what we are looking at is technologies that connect those people together. So two things. One, the technology makes the teacher's job, I don't want to say easier because it's not easy, but it makes it so that they're, they rise to a higher plane in terms of value, right? They're not like explaining things 45 times because of the masses. They are, the students can listen to those kinds of things, and then they are um, working with individuals. So that's a much closer uh, relationship and a, a listening and an interactive relationship with students. And the other thing is that as mentors are working with students, if students have their learning positioning system, they can be engaging their mentor with their own data. Right now, if a student says, you know, how are you doing in school? Yeah, I don't know. Fine, whatever, good. Um, but if they have actually their data, and they can start saying, you know, I did this, I'm trying to get over here. The mentor kind of has a space to engage about real work with students. So totally agree that people interactions are of utmost importance, and the only, the ways we're thinking about technology are the ones that leverage and um, amplify people interactions, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a scout leader, as well as a board member. <laughs> Five years ago, the scouts talked to each other. Today, they're so wrapped in their technology, it's texting each other rather than talking. How do we not overdo the technology that people still can relate to one another in person? I know, you know what's funny about that? Somebody else was just telling me, my kids are past 13 years, but, but teenagers in a car, I used to love riding in the car with my kids because they forget you're driving and you can like, look them over your mirror and watch it and they hear all the stuff you're talking about and they don't really even know you're listening. For some reason, it's odd uh, phenomena. But um, what somebody was just telling me is that the kids are now talking to each other, they're texting to each other, even the ones that are sitting next to them, right? So, <laughs> so this is really interesting, and um, I don't have an easy answer for this. Other, you know, I don't have an easy answer for this. Again, I think with any technology, we have to see what's amplified and what's reduced. And as adults, we have got to get ourselves in the middle of it. It's, and that's hard because a lot of a lot of times with technology we're like, well, I know the kids know more than we do or whatever, which is not a good answer. We have we have to get parents, adults, scout leaders, everybody as up to speed on this as possible. And then acceptable use policies, rules, regulations, the stuff that teachers have teachers and parents have always done. We need to continue to evaluate what's going on and to continue to put those kinds of things in place. Other than that, I don't have a, a great answer. You know, it's like when people used to ask me, you know, could you, uh, <laughs> could you slow down? And it's like, please don't, you know, don't put anything new out into the marketplace with respect to technology. And you know, you can't kind of slow it down. But it, as adults, we have to regulate and um, can't relegate that to, to kids. I, I hear you though, absolutely. Make, make it a scout app. Let them go figure that out. In, in Pennsylvania, we have over 500 separate school districts. So Pennsylvania, and they're very different demographically in the whole spectrum. And, and we talk a lot about how we can get Pennsylvania to change and get moving. And I think there's a lot of agreement that we currently have a governor that is not 
really pro-public education with funding and a lot of other things. What do you see as the tipping point federally that may make everything change? Because again, politically right now, on one side you have a party, which is yours, which is saying we want to do all this. On the other end of the curve, you have a party saying we should get rid of the Department of Education. So you're seeing huge extremes in what's out there. And do you think we're going to be like the, the internet where something's going to happen where it will just tip? So I do feel right now like it's kind of tipping. So, so on the first part of the question, what we try to do at the Department of Education is put high goals, is, is think about, talk about, set high goals, get way more students over a higher bar, but not say, well, everybody has to do it this way, right? You say, here's where you need to get your get students. You need students to graduate from high school, ready to go to college if they want to, ready for a career if they want to, ready to go to technical school if they want to, but we can't keep graduating kids who need, you know, a year and a half, two years of remedial courses, which is basically the new what they need to get in high school. So high goals and then flexible means. So that's the only way I can kind of rationalize kind of different parties of different ideas about how we're going to get there, what, what needs to be in place, right? So communities, yeah. so I feel like you're paying in terms of like the, the various things, but just I like, think keep your eye on the ball, like high needs, and then think of the ways that you're going to get students there. So that's, that's, that's one part of it. The, um, the uh, internet moment thing, what I have seen over the last even year, um, there are, there are dozens and dozens of what, we're, what they call startup weekends. These are people, you know, teachers and, and entrepreneurs who get together on weekends, like for these 48 hour marathons to start designing technologies for learning. So there's a ton of interest and effort. There's a whole new, um, there's a whole new uh, website called EdSurge that's kind of tracking and, and focusing on the education innovation technology industry, brand new in the last year. There's a new conference this year for the first time on learning analytics. So there's all of this movement, and I think what's happening, I do think it's because of the, um, the advancement in mobile, mobile devices, right? And it's been hard to picture all kids having their own computer that they're falling around them. Not that hard to picture them with something, you know, some kind of tablet-ish device that they can stick in the backpack, pull out, use on the bus, use at home, use at school. Um, you know, to track their own learning, keep their own work, access what they need when they need it, something that adapts to them. So, yes? So just to use some of your statements as a jumping off point, if you have all of these broad spectrum learning environments, how do you marry that with standardized testing? Yes. Yes. So, the holy grail, right, to not just put to block the other point on it, is when we get to the point where we don't have to go in and one day out of a year and have everybody take the same test so that we have any idea how we're doing. Like when you think about it, kind of interesting that we've been doing this for this long, and we're continuing to do it. So I'm not saying we're, we're saying get rid of all that. However, as we begin to build the learning technology, we will begin to measure growth and understand growth every day. So it will not be something that we have to do, everybody stop, and today we're gonna to see how we're doing, and based on this one day, we're gonna make all sorts of decisions. Like that's a, not as highly uh, helpful and informed. <laughs> But there are going to be way better, more helpful ways of getting information in very short order. And that is what I am incredibly excited about. We always say we need multiple measures, multiple ways of measuring whether the students are learning, whether the teachers are being helpful, whether our schools are, are helping kids, whether you know, districts are doing well, whether states are doing well, whether we're doing well as a nation, how we compare to other countries. And when we can get to the point where we have so many measures that we really are on it and we can begin to fine tune and get much more precise and effective and efficient and engage people with each other every single day because as an education, a very social kind of, kind of uh, endeavor, then that's, I think, what we're going to see uh, vast improvements.
And that's the good thing. I mean. You can see how the morning with Karen goes very quickly. <laughs> uh, she she loves this. We're going to extend the uh, the general panel session about ten more minutes. I've got a high sign that they have reloaded the food. I got Karen had, had something to breakfast probably. Um, so we can take our break. <laughs> Uh, I think we have a video, and then we will take a break and uh, and return for another presentation, and then a panel, and then our three presentations from the local districts. Thank you again, Karen. Okay. Thank you. 
21st century learner, the video that we saw before at the beginning. Karen, and we're fortunate to have you in the terribly important position that you uh, you've brought. And thanks for your thought for booking comments tonight. We will extend the panel a little bit uh, later. It's obvious that Karen enjoys uh, working on her feet with, uh, with questions in a long and tough learning position system tonight. And, uh, wow, that just blows me away. Um, no more pencils. No more books. No more teachers. iPods, Kindles, iPads, Kindles, Dose. The classroom in my pocket may be a little far-fetched, but the mobile technology print conspiracy theorists are all over it. Anybody here? Public school chemistry teacher, technology administrator, middle school principal, university professor, Apple educational development executive while picking up a PhD all in the last 10 years. John Landis is a poster child for a 21st century career mobility. Or maybe it's just caffeine and job and temperature and deficit disorder. <laughs> John is here tonight as all of these, not just an Apple spokesperson, but a sought-out speaker on the cultural impact <coughs> uh, of mobile computing, innovation, social technologies for the classroom. This morning, he was the keynote at the 26th Annual New Jersey Educational Computing Conference, <laughs> maximizing the possibilities of the connected world. Think back 26 years ago, holding conference number one, 26 years, 1986, the possibilities of a connected world. You're still laying table, you know, under the ocean. I guess the daily double header is in the uh, sights of those who are in demand. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. John Landis. Uh, actually, I have good news and bad news for you. Uh, the good news is uh, your first speaker tonight, uh, Charlie, has actually agreed uh, to buy all of you uh, gourmet cupcakes on the way out the door as a party favor, which I think is really generous. <laughs> <laughs> There's about, about 200 people in the room, and uh, he was uh, he purchased 400 cupcakes. Uh, so you can figure out how many cupcakes you all get on, on the way out the door. But that's the good news. Uh, the bad news, uh, however, is that you, uh, when you bought your ticket for the night, you actually agreed to partake in a small social experiment, which you can now no longer get out of. <laughs> the doors are barred. Uh, that social experiment is, is going to work uh, like this. Uh, I'm going to give you, a, my assistants here are going to pass out a piece of uh, notebook paper in a moment with a sharpened, freshly sharpened number two pencil. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to write down these two numbers. I'm going to ask you to write down 64,365,112. And I'm going to ask you to write down the number 32,611. And the social experiments you're going to participate in is I am going to give you 60 seconds to solve that long division problem by hand. <laughs> right? Now, that's just the act. The social experiment part of it is, now, do me a favor. Does this like the cupcakes, this is entirely hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Let's <laughs> try Sorry, hypothetical. <laughs> so, if, you think, if you could just do me a favor and actually put yourself in that headspace. That's, this is going to actually happen. You're going to have to solve a long division problem. Here's the, here's the crux. Not only are you going to do that, tomorrow morning in the Lancaster paper, I'm going to publish your name, your picture, your credentials, your institution, and you have to show your work. <laughs> can, you, can you put yourself in a headspace just for a second? If that's really going to happen, would any of you be a little nervous? <laughs> Is it fair to say, when I said Charlie bought 400 cupcakes, that you were okay figuring out you were getting two on the way out the door? No, I didn't say anybody, except for that guy I reached for a calculator. I mean, everybody see him? <laughs> Pretty good that 200 people, 400 cupcakes, I'm getting two cupcakes, go me. I got that. But when I talk about 
left-hand calculation, the long division calculation of those two large numbers, there's a little bit of anxiety. Do you understand there's a difference between the concept of division and the calculation of division? You were all really able to use the concept of division very quickly. That's not a big deal. 200, 400, The calculation of division, that hand calculation, is somewhat problematic. We have actually have a really lousy relationship with technology and education for the past you know, several decades. And I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by that uh, throughout this, this presentation. But let's just talk about basic math for a second. Do any of you own small children of your own? Have you ever owned little, little, little tiny? <laughs> I'm a secondary guy. I like them. Like, our middle school principal was awesome. The best stories for dinner time of my entire career was when I was a middle school principal. Are there any middle school people in the house? Middle school educators? Yeah, that's right. Middle school, that's, that's where it's at. Uh, and, you know, I thought high school. Okay. Little kids kind of freak me out a little bit. They're, I had to cover an elementary school principal gig for a little while, just for a couple weeks for college in Brazil. They're very huggy. There's a lot of hugging. There's a lot of snot. There's a lot of wetness. <laughs> little, little kids are not my fun. If you've ever been through that yourself, you've ever had the first and second grade of kids, but there's this rite of passage in all schools throughout all countries. Uh, the flashcard readers, you know what I'm talking about? You know, it seems like they're barely on the high chair and we're drilling and killing with flashcards because everybody has some of their math facts. I mean, that's just basic human survival, your math facts. Um, in fact, we actually, uh, well, let me just set this up. I was observing a teacher teach not too long ago. Uh, a powerfully good first grade teacher. Somebody I would put my kids in her classroom in a heartbeat, right? Uh, when I walk into the room, she is standing on a desk with a stopwatch in her hand, right? And there are, you know, 20 first graders, eager, well, it's probably like 30 today, like, you know, 20 first graders, five, <laughs> number two pencil poised above their head. In this, she said she was creating a positive culture of anxiety. To me, just like after fear, right? She, she screams at the top of her lungs, go! And snaps the button. These kids have 60 seconds to do 60 problems, right? As many as you can, right? And you got, you know, you got a guy like Sid, he's knocking out, he's just mapped out 60, 60 problems. He's just going through. He has a time to write a note to the teacher at the bottom. You know, he gets his gold star. And we, we put Sid in the, the A math. I'm sorry. We would not delineate students by putting them in an A group, right? You would be in the art art group, perhaps? <laughs> and then next, next to Sid is Charlie, right? Charlie's a little bit of a dreamer. He gets to the first three problems, starts doodling on the side of his page, <laughs> drawing Nirvana logos over there, like that. It spells his name wrong. You know, like, like, so Charlie gets four problems, three problems correct. And we don't put him in the A math group or the art the art group. You're going to go to the sloth math group. <laughs> we actually track kids based on their ability to do time math fact recall in first and second grade. We're all put Sid in an accelerated math group, and I'll put Charlie in, 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 a, in a slower math group. You know that that has nothing to do with mathematics? It doesn't have anything to do with calculation either. It's symbolic language recall. I might as well be giving them a list of pictures and words that go with them. There's nothing to do with mathematics, but we use it as a filter, sort of a stereotypical filter, to get entry into mathematics. In fact, 80% of you in this room think you're bad at math. That's a national statistic. 80% of you, if I said, hey, let's go do math after this event, let's go have a math workshop tomorrow morning, you'd break out in pods. Like that would be, you have this aversion to math. But you know what, if you can put together an outfit, if you can say that this goes with that, or if you can say, hey, I want to put together this room, like we're going to put, I have 30 people, and I'm going to head table with 15, or I'm going to do, if you can visualize what the furniture should look like in your house, that's all spatial reasoning. You're probably a brilliant mathematician until the math system of school beat it out of you, right? <laughs> we don't allow our children to learn the mathematical concepts. I don't know if any of you are early childhood educators, but don't throw anything at me just yet. We should be giving first and second graders four function calculators when they walk in the door and never have them solve a math problem out of context. Every math problem they see, every first problem they've ever seen is always related to their world. It's always with their vocabulary, their context, the things that they're interested in, the things that they're angry about. All math always related. Yes, people, this is work problems all the time. They never get a list of math problems devoid of context. Everything's in context. And you know what? They can use a calculator whenever they want. I know this is crazy talk, but just bear with me. They use a calculator whenever they want. And you know what? After you punch four times four in a calculator a dozen times, your brain will tell you, hey, idiot, it's 16, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> you will accidentally memorize most of your math problems. I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, don't walk out of here saying some crazy guy from Apple said you don't need to know your math facts. It's not what I'm saying. You definitely need to know your math facts. But how about we do math facts in May? 
after we've learned mathematical concepts all year long, we've played with it, we know, we know that it's part of the world, they, they see the patterns. You know, you know the patterns? Like, after a kid sees, like, what patterns have you seen? Well, every time you multiply by one, it's the same thing. Every time I multiply by zero, it disappears. Every time I multiply by five, it either ends in zero or five. Every time I multiply by two, it's an even number. Like, those are patterns in nature. They're not cheats. We teach them as cheats. Now, this is how you do your two's time schedule really quickly. Here's how you do your five schedule. We teach them as these little tricks. They're not tricks. They arise out of the language that is mathematics. Actually, I think the best thing we could do is we should move mathematics out of the math department and into the world language department. Mm -hmm. We should teach mathematics as a language that explains the universe, not this weird book of disconnected problems where you all right now, if I say math, the first thing you think of is a textbook. The first thing you think about is a worksheet. And usually then you put down the right? <laughs> there are very few people that like mathematics because we teach it back. We actually teach it completely backwards. We teach <laughs> basic mathematics has to go first, right? But then after you, know, you get into the advanced basic mathematics, we go to algebra, then geometry, the trigonometry, the calculus. You know, we've had the ability to calculate for 30 years, and we haven't quite got all of that. But you understand the concepts of calculus are actually really applicable to fifth graders. So like this, this is like a monitor, this chair. The volume of this chair, this is what we would call mathematics in a regular sum. <laughs> If I ask you, how much water does this chair hold if it's a container? Your fourth grade brain can understand that concept. This is a, this is a container, it's actually kind of a cool concept. Like, where would the straw go? I mean, this is kind of a cool thing. <laughs> chair is a juice box, that could be our unit, right? That's a calculus problem. That's an integration, that's a differential. I mean, that is a, now the problem is, it's a page worth of calculations to hand do it. But approaching infinite limits and things like that, that can be done by a calculator, you know, calculator computer. The concept, of that calculus problem is easily accessible to a young student. We start with algebra because the calculation is easy. Solving a binomial expression is really easy to do. It's like three steps. I can still do it, right? If you like math, I'm sure you can do it. But you understand, even I like math, right? I'm pretty decent at math. I still have a hard time understanding exactly what a binomial expression means. Like, what it real? I know the tricks. Like, I know how to solve the a squared b squared. I can get to the answer. But what does it physically represent in the universe is an incredibly abstract concept. It doesn't make much sense. And when do we start to lose kids in math? Then sixth, seventh grade. And we start to get into the abstract concepts. Because we start with the incredibly abstract and advanced algebra. We could switch it. Right? We could actually teach calculus, then geometry, then trigonometry, then algebra. If we allow the computers to do the heavy lifting. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying get away from math and math facts and people knowing how to do basic calculations and understanding. But we're going back to my original point. You can understand the concept of division and have value in that concept, even if you can't hand calculate. So we treat hand calculation facts as a barrier. We have not done well leveraging technology in education. And those kids that get really interested in math, good at math, they can learn how to hand calculate a square root. When's the last time you've had it? Those, most of you in this room are very successful people. How many binomial expressions have you solved today? <laughs> but we make it a barrier to get out of seventh grade. Like you can't get out of seventh grade advanced math until you can do a binomial expression. Let's even let's back the technology up a little bit. I taught chemistry for a while. Actually, really, I really like blowing stuff up. That was fun. I got it. <laughs> if I was growing up today, I would have been a, a person of interest. <laughs> challenge me to go off and do a career and actually do that and I got paid to do that. Um, but I did this horrible thing for the first eight years I taught chemistry. I actually made kids memorize the periodic table on day one. Like if you start, I didn't have to start on Wednesday, that Friday you got the periodic table memorized. That was a rule of my class. Because chemistry is a new language, it explains the universe, we can't speak this new language unless you know the new words, the new words are made out of this new alphabet, ergo you have to know the alphabet before we can get started. Friday. I actually created a culture of oppression in my classroom. And I, to me, in my warped brain at the time, I'm thinking, you know, this is like the Marines, right? They're going to go through boot camp, and they're going to come out stronger on the other side. I don't know where this military analogy of invading Normandy was sort of equating with chemistry. I don't know where I got misguided. But that's sort of where I was in my headspace. It wasn't until I took a group of students to a Merck chemical facility on a field trip to meet a friend of mine that was a chemist. And I'm, we're talking with him in his office, and I look above his head in his office, and what's above his head? What is above his desk? A huge periodic table, right? So here's like the one guy in the universe that's actually using this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. And if he wants to know something on this periodic table, what does he do? He turns his head, it's right there.
It's it, it, in fact, I remember distinctly grading redox tests. Don't freak out, we're not gonna actually do that. But these redox things where you're balancing charges, where if you pick the wrong, if you if I said I gave them the words, I would say, you know, use iron. If they pick the wrong thing, if they used I, which would make logical sense, but no, it's Fe, right? So if they used I instead of Fe, it's in the wrong column, they got the wrong charge, they would get the wrong answer at the end. Even if they did every step correctly, they put the wrong ingredients in at the beginning of the chain, they'd get it wrong. You understand, my assessment though was to measure if they could do redox reactions or not, but I wasn't grading it. I was actually still grading day one material, balancing this periodic table, or understanding the periodic table. What I should have done, and started doing too late in my career, was leverage a piece of Gutenberg technology, right? Care reference, Gutenberg. Use a piece of Gutenberg technology. That student should have had access to the periodic table all year long, whenever they want, whenever they needed. It should have been actually wanted buying little wallet sized periodic tables to hand out to kids. That is the true mark of a nerd if you're carrying around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I still have that on. <laughs> but anywhere they needed, I gave them a glossy version, one they could write on, one for their wallet, they had it everywhere. And you know what? Not that I still think you need to know your periodic table, but I made that part of the course at the end of the year. This is, of course, after eight years of screwing kids up. I finally figured out if I do it at the end of the year, they've already memorized half of it. It's not that the memorization of those facts isn't important, but it doesn't have to be a barrier. I, I mentioned Gutenberg. Karen talked about Gutenberg for a second. Let's, do you realize what happened then? We don't take a look back very often. Fascinating. Prior to Gutenberg, prior to Gutenberg coming onto the planet, written recorded knowledge was the purview of two things. You were either wealthy or you were the church. If you were not extremely wealthy, or you were not the church, you did not have access to books, written, the things we take for granted, leaving a note for your kids, reading a story at night, that didn't exist in culture. Gutenberg comes along, makes an inexpensive way to reproduce printed material, or actually to make printed material for the first time ever. We still use the term, the press, you know, it's invaded all parts of our culture. Do you know it only took two decades for that single invention to be completely replicated across all of Europe? Two decades. Everything changed about humankind. Average vocabulary changed, it all went up. IQ went up, professions changed, cities changed, cities actually started. I mean, the aggregation of written material allowed for a lot of things to occur. It was a piece of technology that changed human culture. In fact, our historical anthropologists and sociologists look back, that was one of the most pivotal times in human history. Everything we know about humanity changed in a very short period of time because of the invention of a piece of technology. Here's the frightening thing, or fabulous thing, depending on how you look at it. Actually, let me explain it. The fabulous thing is, we are currently in the middle of what is going to be a more impactful revolution than Gutenberg ever was. The estimation is that by an order of magnitude. And you've all been around for it. And it's hard to believe, it's hard to actually think about this. You all were probably professionals before there was email. Can you imagine doing your job without email, most of you? I mean, think about how much time you spend to a game. What did we do before that? You know? Do you guys remember getting the first modem in your house? You know, you got that 14-4 modem, watch those pictures download, right? <laughs> I, I distinctly remember having a conversation with my wife, convincing her why I needed to spend $200 to get a 56K modem so we could watch the pictures download a lot faster. I mean, like, that, I, I remember that advent of the internet. We all have done it. We've all been around for it. Here's the frightening thing, or the fabulous. If you look at that blue line, that is traditional internet access. That is desktop and laptop internet access. That's what we both know as the internet. The green line represents mobile technologies, mobile internet. That's iPhones and Android phones and tablets and things like that. Things with a mobile operating system. In 2013, mobile internet access is going to outpace traditional internet access. That right there, that's your Gutenberg moment. If you're a Malcolm Gladwell fan, that's your tipping point. That is a point at which humanity is no longer the same. You're here for it. Not only are you here for it, most of you are involved in a profession that helps people make meaning out of their lives while this is going on. This is one of, not one of, it is the most revolutionary time in human history. We're changing everything about the human condition. By the way, you can argue about whether this is good or not. We can have a discussion whether this is value positive or value neutral or value negative. Those, those are definitely real conversations. But to argue whether or not it's happening is really pointless. Right? The train hasn't left the station, it left the solar system. Right? So big tip for you tonight. This is your big takeaway. The internet is not bad. Right? <laughs> cell phones are not going away. They're going to get faster and cheaper. And cheaper. I mean, and it's hard to even imagine. It's hard to get the perspective on it. But let's, you know, 
we mentioned the conference 26 years ago. Let's just say 15 years ago. 15 years ago, a Karen Cater like person is the keynote at a conference that you're at. You really want to see you know, the keynote. It's not the usual conference you go to where you blow off the keynote speaker to go you know, talk with your friends. And those of you that do friends on conferences. <laughs> those of us that do academic conferences, keynote literally means go get drinks with people you haven't seen in forever. That's how you read the keynote. But sometimes the keynote speaker is somebody really great, you know, like a Karen Cater. You want to come and you want to see that. So you're all at this event 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And the, the keynote speaker gets up, and somebody you trust, and she says, hey, I've been working with industry. I know the roadmap, all right? They're working on a device right now. It'll come out in the next 15 to 20 years. This device will let you look up any fact from vetted databases. I don't mean just like the volume of encyclopedia that we have now. I mean any <coughs> fact. It could be particle physics. It could be music theory. It could be any fact. Don't just think encyclopedia. Think thousands of millions of volumes. You can read any book that any author has ever made. You can look at any piece of artwork that human beings have ever created by hand. Listen to any piece of music that people have created. You'll be able to shoot and edit video, shoot and edit audio. You will be able to talk to any human being face to face, just like your kids saw this morning on the Jetsons. And by the way, this device is going to fit in your pocket and kids are going to bring it to school accidentally. <laughs> If you are currently sitting in an 8th grade class that I was in about a year ago, and I watched a kid get up at the end of an 8th grade math lecture, right? And the teacher's done just diagramming a huge problem. This is just not too long ago. It's a huge problem. And she sits down and the bell rings. And he's walking out of the classroom. He does this. Watches for the teacher, watches for the teacher, snaps a picture of goes. I chase him down the hall after I real he realizes I'm not a teacher, I'm not going to take his phone. And I ask him, what are you doing? His buddy's sick today. He's not in class. He's snapping a picture of what's on the board so he can take it home with him. Right? If you get these out in class today, most schools, you go to school jail. Right? <laughs> Some jackboot stuff takes this from you. And don't get me wrong. I, I, get, I get to paint your big, broad, utopian brushes here because you know, there, are, there are definitely practical difficulties with having these devices in the hands of children. Trust me. My internet research, you know, before I came, started with that. I did a lot of research and work in the field of internet risks. If you haven't noticed, there's some bad things on the internet, okay? <laughs> Another tip for today. You're learning so much. <laughs> there are definitely risks associated with this, but to say there aren't opportunities is so short-sighted. We are at a point in history where everything is changing, and the one thing that should be changing most rapidly are our schools. You know the old anecdote that's been told a thousand times, that the, the time traveler from the past you know, from 200 years ago, lands today, and he's walking around, and everything is so weird and different, he can't figure anything out until he runs into the school, and he knows exactly what it is. <laughs> you know, that's not my name. That's, I mean, that's historically better on her. The idea now is that how many of you are actually educated or have been educated? Oh, well, I've been educated. Don't, don't throw anything yet. Just give me, let me finish the statement and I'll explain it. This is a very highly prejudicial statement. Your value as a teacher is no longer your ability to deliver content. Your value as a teacher is no longer your ability to deliver content. If all you did in the past was deliver content, you actually had some value, because content was scarce. Content was locked up in dead trees in teachers' heads. <laughs> if you didn't have access to books or, or faculty, you didn't have access to the, to the information. So school was predicated on bringing the learned people to the unlearned people and having a transfer occur, whether that happens virtually or physically. The, 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 what, what has happened, though, is over the past several years, really good content exists. I, when I mentioned I taught chemistry. Right now, if you're sitting in my chemistry class, 10 years ago you're sitting in my chemistry class, if you didn't like me or you didn't get me, you were stuck. You had me, the Zoom Dog chemistry book, maybe a tutor if your mom would pop for it. Like, that's it, right? If you don't get me now, you can go watch the chemistry lectures from Oxford University, from Stanford, from MIT, from high schools all over the country. All free, all vetted. Chemistry content, art content, history content, it's freely available and it's good. If all you do is tell kids stuff, not only can you be replaced by a computer, I would replace you with a vinyl record. All you're doing is telling people stuff. However, as has been referenced, I do believe we're on the, the cusp, lest you think I'm devaluing educators. I think we're on the cusp of the role of educator becoming elevated to such a status as we've never seen before. Because we can now separate the act of content delivery from the act of teaching. Teaching is not content delivery. 
Content delivery is reading. Content delivery is watching. Content delivery is, is, is manipulating. Teaching is about relationship. Teaching is about shepherding. It's not what is chemistry, it's what is chemistry to you. How do I make it relevant to you? How do I clear up your misconceptions? How do I make it relevant to your world? How do I listen to what you're saying and say, no, no, that's not right, try this. That's a relationship thing. By the way, the answer to all of our incredible technology risks, sexting, texting, over, you know, all that crazy stuff, the answer to all that is surprisingly non-technological. It's relationships. We need teachers in front of kids. They get to know them and get to understand them. And it can be happen virtually, it can happen face to face, it can happen in a variety of ways. But we need interfaces where people get to know teachers and then students to a level that relationships can be forged, where I can shepherd kids to the content. As we hire teachers, I know we have a lot of administrators in the building. As we hire teachers, content expertise is good, but it should play second fiddle to argue a good relationship builder. Do you understand kids? Can you relate to the people you're talking to? Because the content I can get, it's the, can I relate to people that's going to be the most important thing going forward? This is an incredible time to be involved in education. Things like this have never been available to us before. Do you understand the difference between the information nodes today and just a few years ago? My, my daughter is, is, uh, is, is 20 years old. She's a college sophomore. When she was born 20 years ago, and, and uh, her mom and I, you know, early 20s, we have this uh, lovely, colicky bundle of joy. Uh, if she wakes up on a Saturday morning and she has some weird rash on her leg, you know, she has a weird red mark, we're not sure if it's an insect bite or a rash, we're freaking out as only first time parents can do. Second kid, you're a little less freaky, right? You can, you can wait till Monday. But the first, first kid, you're freaking out. What did I do on a Saturday morning, you know, 20 years ago? I would call my mom. My wife would call her mom. I would go to the What to Expect When You're Expecting book, right? Yeah, that 20 years old. Makes you feel very old, right? So, but that was our information. What would my daughter do today if she had a baby? And by the way, my daughter, she's not having a baby. Not having a baby. <laughs> the role of grandfather when this is currently filled and is not up for re-election, right? So if, if, I had, if I had my daughter is there today with her child and there's a weird mark on her leg, what does she do? <laughs> Probably without leaving the nursery, right? She's going to reach into her pocket. She's going to go to WebMD. She's going to snap a picture of the rash and upload it. Get some medical student commenting on it, right? They, the paradigm is so different. In, in fact, you can make a case that the exact opposite problem is true now. In the past, it's what was the information? I had these three notes. What do I do? Now I have so much information, what is true? For all I know, my daughter's getting information from a seventh grade life science report, right? <laughs> <laughs> she's going to be diagnosed as MRSA, a tropical disease, or she's going to be you know, bamboozled by some charlatan who's selling magic bracelets, you know, or something like that. There's two, our kids are growing up in a world that is so fundamentally different from us, and yet we have this, if I could just peek into your psyche for a second, we have this knee-jerk reaction because of all the risks associated with technology, and they are real. We want to sometimes just grab our kids, take them, unplug them from everything, talk to them, basic reading, basic math, take them back to that world, that little house in the prairie world where it was really safe. We, I, I understand the visceral, emotional connection. We want to do that. That is not the world our children are going to be going into when they're on their own. It is a highly connected world with a new level of risk and also new opportunities that have never been available to us. Your children have an international voice as soon as they are connected. I mean, that's, that somebody can put up a YouTube video that lives in like central Iowa and have 10,000 people follow them with millions of hits to the point where they are paying for their college education with their YouTube videos. That didn't exist for us, thank goodness. I mean, could you imagine if YouTube was available when we were growing up? Seriously. How many of you would be recognized professionals? <laughs> well respected individuals. If there was YouTube when you were growing up. I've talked to some of your parents. I know. It was amazing. I'll make another pitch for why this world is different. Karen, you needed this. Accessibility is no longer just something we have to bolt on to things. We know how, I, was, I, I was at a school the other week, it was a couple months ago, but there was a, it was a student. I didn't realize at the time. This group of students participating in whiteboard activity. They were playing a game. Uh, and they were playing a game for candy, so this is clearly not a Pennsylvania school. <laughs> and they were doing this thing where they were, they were typing in little virtual sticky notes and they're throwing this stuff on their iPad and throwing these virtual notes up there. And the game is competitive. Uh, one of the students was flying. 
and I didn't realize it at the time. Her braille reader works wirelessly with the, with the iPad, and they're going at it. And because she's blind, she can turn her screen off. You get about 20% more battery life, right? and nobody can see what you're doing. She's winning the game. <laughs> Everybody wants to partner with the blind kids. Her pile of is like this, and she's just, she's just going, but the thing is that the adaptation for her was completely invisible. Talk about a non-restrictive or least restrictive environment. It enabled her to participate in the classroom or, or bring, be able to bring a sign language interpreter now remotely where a student can hold a device with face-to-face -face video conferencing and talk, have a sign language interpreter in their lap everywhere they go without having to pay for a human being to follow them around and transfer. As I was mentioned previously, being at home alone with the text, being a really smart kid but also having dyslexia and having the text read to you by your device. These are incredible opportunities that we have where we can bring up the level of education for every student, not just the lowest common denominator. In fact, even what we're preparing them for is totally different. I, I, I decided I'd go with doctor, right? I decided I'd go with doctor. I think doctors still are the stereotypically top of the food chain professions. As far as I know, we're not talking people out of becoming doctors yet. I know we're talking about being lawyers. I know we're talking about being educators. It's a tough job right now. As far as I know, doctor's still OK. In the past, I'm going to keep picking on Sid. Sid's in a horrible car accident. And he's bleeding out. He's unconscious. And he comes to the ER. And unfortunately, I am your doctor. So the doctor in sociology is going to treat you on a year. Um, I don't have time to go, like, he has a medical alert bracelet. I don't have time to go look up what that condition means, right? I don't have time to look up the drug interactions or what anesthetic I can give him. i got to know. i got to be a certain kind of person to be a doctor. You have to have all this information in your, not actually true anymore. Ohio State Medical School, when you get your white lab coat, when you get your residency coat, in the pocket is an iPod touch. When they're, they're learning that when they're in a system of stress and they have to do a drug interaction, they'll pull out this little device. The leverage the mobile information, it's Hippocrates, it's a free database you can get yourself on, on your phone. <coughs> I could look up the drug interaction in real time with 100% accuracy, not relying on my memory in a time of stress or lack of sleep, and get information within 15 seconds that's incredibly accurate and make, make a better standard of care for my, for my patient. We're now changing the types of people that can even become doctors. In the past, you had to be able to, by the way, don't swing the pendulum too far in your head, right? You don't want to have people that are like, punch in, you keep telling symptoms, and they keep punching them in, and then they go, hey, you have the flu. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. We right? <laughs> don't make a bunch of high doctors. We have to train people to have leverage mobile information, because it's out there that you've been And if we keep ignoring the fact that it's there, if we keep putting our proverbial head in the sand, you know, things will change. Things, we're just gonna, we're gonna, even if you have your head in the sand, you can still get hit by the bus, right? It's still coming. Let me, let me wrap this up with a quick anecdote, and then we can move into our panel and have some conversations and have a good content. Uh, I, I, I grew up in this area. I get to speak all over the, all over the country. I, I grew up very, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster, Georgia. And I used to swim in the East Petersburg pool when I was a, a, a young lad. And there was one particular summer where I was, uh, with a small group of friends, and we, well, to be honest, we were trying to pick up some other uh, young girls that were in the pool, and we were diving off the three meter board. You can tell us a long time ago because three meter boards were still in pools, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, diving off the three meter board, and I'm sure it was a tremendously robust dive. Most people look spectacular. I slipped a disc in my back all the time. You know, kind of completely paralytic, crash into the water, sink to the bottom of the deep end, be rescued by people. Which, by the way, not a good way to pick up ladies. Not, <laughs> not an effective way to uh, get a date. Uh, but I had to have surgery. It was a four inch scar. I was in the hospital for about a week. Um, I did not take PE my entire senior year. I may have looked at that a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, it was a pretty basic surgery. Uh, Ten years later, 27 years old, and coaching soccer, I slipped a different disc. It's a hobby. Some people collect stamps. I'm collecting surgery. Uh, this time, uh, two inch scar. Our recovery time was about three days. Uh, back to work, you know, really doing everything long, long, three days, three days. Uh, almost two years ago, I did not slip another disc. That would be crazy. Uh, that really wouldn't be a fun. Uh, guy in this area slips a disc. He goes in. It's a half inch scar. It's like little Keebler elves went in there with magic tools. This is spinal surgery, and it was outpatient. 23 hours. <coughs> which probably more a result of insurance laws than anything else. <laughs> Still, spinal surgery, 23 hours. Little tiny incision for a slip disc. Back, he's one of those crazy runner dudes. Like, I like to run, this one of those clowns that runs 50 miles a week. One of those, like, you're not well runners, right? He was back to his full running regimen in three weeks. Why am I telling you this story? 
same doctor, all three surgeries. If you were to go to that doctor today, and you said, I have a split disc, and he said, hey, I got this great procedure. It's a four inch scar, it's only gonna take you a week in the hospital, be back to work in a month. You would sue him for malpractice, right? The profession of medicine has evolved with technology where technology creates a better standard of care. It's, it's not even a question, it has to happen. In education, we've gotten away with pushing back on technology, but to be honest with you, quite frankly, we've had good reason to. Nobody's life has been saved by Scantron, right? <laughs> if, 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 nobody's, you know, educational world has been rocked by moving from a blackboard to an overhead to a projector to a smartboard, right? Nothing changes pedagogically. If you, here, here's a new slide for those of you that spend money on technology and education. If you give a crappy teacher a $10,000 smartphone, you just have a more expensive crappy teacher. <laughs> technology fixes nothing. Technology fixes nothing. Technology is an incredible tool that can fix everything near it if it's used appropriately. But the stuff itself doesn't fix anything. We are now at the point with technology, particularly the deconstruction of the scarcity model, the fact that information is no longer scarce, it's everywhere. We are now at a point where this decision to use these types of technologies is no longer a technological one at all, it's an ethical one. How do we get these tools into the hands of our kids that will fundamentally make their lives better, which means our lives are better as a culture, as a human culture, as a society? This isn't about gadgets and gizmos and making sure our kids have iPads because that's the hip new trex, you know, send, sexy thing to do. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not about the device at all. We have to be making decisions regarding technology education around educational opportunity. And the opportunities are immense right now. And it's, most, it's, it's an incredibly fabulous time and an incredibly frightening time to get education. But what we need are educational leaders and educational decision makers that are starting to look at these things outside of the usual paradigms. This is not simply about getting devices in the hands of kids. It's about fundamentally changing the human condition. Thank you. And I think we're now moving to a path. Correct?